Good morning. Welcome to Orchard Park Presbyterian Church. Happy Father's Day. Let us gather together and worship God. This morning, I'd like to remind you that we are having a blood drive today at the church in the lounge from 8.30 to 12.30, and you can come by and give blood um, during that time. We hope to see you there. And now, let us gather and worship God. my dad because he helps me with the things I don't know how to do. I love my dad because he makes me smile. What I, what I love about my dad is that he takes care of us. And also he loves us with all of his heart. Thanks dad. Thank you. What I love about my dad is how hardworking he is and how he won't stop working until he's finished the project. I just love that, um, the work ethic he has. And my favorite thing that my dad has taught me is how to have a good work ethic myself and I feel like I wouldn't be the person I am now well I definitely wouldn't if it weren't for him and I feel like he deserves credit he deserves credit for that I love my dad 
because he's always been there for me. And I just think he's the best dad in the world. No way, the galaxy. No way, the universe. And he taught me how to play basketball. Come on, Cora. What do you like about your dad? He loves me. I love him. And he taught me how to play basketball. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Uh, I love how uh, much you care about everyone, and you taught me how to be such a hard worker. I love how kind you are, and you taught me how important community service is. Um, I love how we can talk about anything, and that you taught me how to treat everyone equally. The thing that I love most about my dad is that he always makes time for me. What do you love about daddy? Raising me Skippy John Jones. Yeah, is he a good daddy? Yeah. I love our dad because he is very kind hearted and he always helps us get better at the things we love. Hey Dad, so there are many things that I love about you, but the thing that I love most about you is your willingness to always be there for us. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Um, the one thing I love about you the most is how we, all, we always spend time together. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Happy Father's Happy Day. Happy Father's Day. Um, what I love about you most is your outgoing personality and your love for all of us five kids. And what I've learned from you most is how to be an adult and still look at the fun side and faith and everything. Confident in God's endless love and mercy, let us now confess our sin to God. Let us pray. O oh God, you created us. You know us and understand us. You realize that at times we come up short. We desire to be generous, but withhold from others and from you. We desire to be Christ-like in our actions, but we can forget and follow the values and examples that this world offers us. We desire to be kind and loving, but can allow fatigue and stress to deter us from these good intentions. Forgive us, O Lord and allow your grace to wash over us. Help us to forgive others and to forgive ourselves and to begin anew each day. Lord, hear now our silent confession. In the name of our Savior, we pray, amen. Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Let us now extend the peace of Christ to those who are with us in body or in spirit. May the peace of Christ be with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Good morning, boys and girls. Did you know that today is Father's Day? I hope that you can wish your fathers and people who are like fathers to you a happy Father's Day today. 
The Bible story that Pastor Shelley will be preaching about today has a child in it named Ishmael. Ishmael was a child who was in a really scary situation with his mom, Hagar. They were out in the middle of a desert and they ran out of water and there was no water anywhere nearby. That scared them so much that they both began to cry. Sometimes when we get scared, we try to hide our tears. We don't like others to know that we are afraid. But did you know that God always knows and that God always hears our cries? In the story for today, God heard the child Ishmael crying and he helped him and his mom. He helped them find a beautiful spring of water right in the middle of that dry desert. God heard Ishmael when he was afraid and when he was crying and God helped him. In fact, Ishmael's name means God hears. Jesus cried and called on God when he was afraid too. Jesus was God's son and he called God his father in heaven. And he said that God is our father in heaven too. He always hears us when we cry and when we cry out, he wants to help us and comfort us and to make us feel better. So always remember the name Ishmael means God hears. God hears us when we cry and God wants to comfort us. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you that you always hear us, that you hear us when we are happy, when we are sad, when we are afraid, when we cry. Lord, help us to not be ashamed, but to cry to you so that you can help us and comfort us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
life to me One word you speak Quiet my heart, I'm listening I want to miss one word you speak Cause everything you say is life to me I want to miss one word you speak Everything you say is life to me I don't want to miss one word you speak Quiet my heart, I'm listening Our scripture reading this morning comes to us from the book of Genesis, the 21st chapter, beginning with the 8th verse. Hear and receive the word of God to you today. The child grew and was weaned. And on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had borne to Abraham was mocking, and she said to Abraham, Get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son, but God said to him, do not be so distressed about the boy and your maidservant. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of your maidservant into a nation also, because he is your offspring. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. And he set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. And she went on her way, and she wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and she sat down nearby, about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there nearby, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy and take him by the hand. For while I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert, and he became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him. From Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing, be heard, and be reverential in your sight, we pray. Amen. There are stories in the Bible that are painful to read and even imagine in our mind's eye. 
The fact that they are there, however, gives credibility to the Bible as a whole because the Bible tells the truth, and often the truth hurts, but it also always heals. In my mind, the Bible has integrity because it doesn't just tell wonderful stories, it also tells awful stories, and the Holy Spirit compels us to acknowledge them. To understand what the Bible and the Gospels are all about, Frederick Binkner writes, you have to understand their unblinking reflection of everyday reality. Even our ancient story today is a reflection of everyday reality. Abraham and Sarah were promised parents of God's chosen nation. They are rich and established, and they are powerful. They have flocks and sheep and goats, and they have tents and slaves. Abraham has a harem befitting a man of his station. But what Abraham and Sarah do not have is a son. And that's a problem if they are going to be parents of a great nation. And so, consistent with custom, Sarah suggests her favorite slave, Hagar, an Egyptian, might become the mother of Abraham's son. Now recognize, of course, that a slave would not have a say in this manner. So that's what happens. And his name is Ishmael. But then something truly unexpected occurs. Sarah has a son and calls him Isaac. And one day, Sarah sees Isaac and Ishmael playing together, and a terrible thought occurs to her. Why, Ishmael is actually Abraham's oldest son, and that means he has status. He has a claim on the family's patrimony. Isaac may be the hero and the point of the biblical narrative, but what in the world are we going to do with Ishmael and Hagar, his mother? Sarah knows exactly how to deal with the situation. She distanced herself from her favorite slave. She no longer uses her name. She dehumanizes her. She demonizes her. And then she concludes there is no room for Hagar and Ishmael, and they have to go. Now, Abraham is reluctant, but ultimately he agrees. And in a pathetic gesture, he gives Hagar a little bread and water, and then he throws them out into the desert with her infant son. Hagar and Ishmael are unnecessary and they are expendable. And in the wilderness, the inedible happens. The bread and the water run out. As you know, human beings can't survive without water and particularly babies. And so Ishmael starts to die from dehydration. Hagar will die soon too, but Ishmael is going to die first in her arms. As the crisis approaches, Hagar cannot bear it, and there are no more, more tragically poignant words than hers. Let me not see the death of my child. Hagar carefully lays the infant under a bush and she walks a hundred feet away and she sits down and she sobs and she waits and the baby cries. And then given what is going on with the big picture of Abraham and Sarah and the chosen people and the descendants more numerous than the stars, in the middle of this text is an astonishing assertion. God hears the cry of an infant. And an angel appears and says what angels are always saying in the Bible to shepherds in Bethlehem hillside, to a weeping woman in the tomb, do not be afraid. God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come and lift him up and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. And then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water and she went and she filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. From the very beginning of the Bible, God keeps reminding us 
that God does not forget about the ones who get pushed on the margins or pushed out of the big story. From the very beginning, God is passionately committed to the very ones the traditions and the customs and the law of God's people exclude. Moreover, God is not selective in whose cries he hears. God hears the cries of all children. God shows up in whatever wilderness we find ourselves. God comes to bring us water for our thirst and love for our deepest need. God does not abandon or forget. William Faulkner once said, past is not dead. It's not even past. There are Hagars and Ishmaels. There are mothers and children all over the world this morning that are crying for their children's lives. And they are considered expendable. The protests that have come to small towns and major cities across the country and the world are voices who are bringing attention to the trauma of the suffering of racial injustice that just keeps going. There was a picture taken in Tampa, Florida of a five-year-old black boy holding a sign that said, Stop killing us. Stop killing us. And that stays in my mind as vividly as Hagar placing her baby under a bush to die. There is an African proverb that says, The child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. Tara Brock reflects on this statement saying, In our shared village, at least for Americans, for over 400 years, black people have been enslaved, demeaned, exploited, imprisoned, and lynched. They are the tormented child, and we know this at least conceptually. To the right race, black lives have not mattered. They have been considered expendable. And just as we have all been harmed by the village because of the toxicity of our culture, this harms us all. And just as we can become attuned to those who are most horrifically harmed because we are part of the village and we participate in the harming. She goes on to say that the legacy of racism is not our personal fault, but we carry its poison in this assumption of black inferiority because we examine ourselves we will not be conscious of it unless we examine ourselves. And daily we reap the benefits. Daily we reap the benefits. Perhaps the deepest expression of white privilege is that part of our village is hurting and we're forced to try to save their lives. And for white people, responding to this pain feels optional. We may care, we may do some things, but it feels optional. We forget that this is a child in our heart. Martin Luther King says, Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. So thank God the book of Genesis recounts this story and shows us the mind of God and reveals that God seeks out all of his children, blesses those that humanity has disposed of, and loves all of his children. Thank God, God is a loving God. That has been true from the beginning of time, and it is true today, and that should give us some hope. We have witnessed something hopeful in the midst of all of this pain, and that is people of all races and ages and demographics have gathered peacefully, and they are praying, and they are caring, and the soul of a burned village is being nourished. The world is turning to Abraham and Sarah, and they are saying, what you are doing is wrong. There is a cry in the wilderness and we must change the narrative. Brian Stevenson is an activist, and he shares this story. 
He writes, we have been doing this thing where we have people go to lynching sites and we have them collect soil from the lynching site and put them in a jar. And on our museum, we have hundreds of these jars of soil and they are collected from lynching sites. And we have the name of the lynching victim and we have the date of the lynching. And it's been really powerful to give people an opportunity to do something tangible to do something redemptive, to do something restorative. People come and they go to these places and we give them a memo and it's really powerful. Well, we had a middle-aged black woman come to one of our events and she was nervous about going to a lynching site by herself, but she was fired up and so we gave her the jar and we gave her the memo and she went out to this lynching site, pretty remote area. She got really nervous, but she decided to do it. So she went to the place where the lynching took place and she was about to start digging when a truck drove by. And there was this white man in the truck who slowed down and stared at her. And then she said that the truck stopped and turned around and drove back. And the man stared at her some more and then it stopped. And then this big white guy got out and started walking towards her and she was nervous. Now we tell people, you don't have to explain what you're doing. If you want to say you are just getting dirt from your garden, feel free to say that. And that's what she intended to do, but this white man walked up to her and said, what are you doing? And she said, something got a hold of me and I turned to the man and I said, I'm digging soil because this is where a black man was lynched in 1931 and I'm going to honor his life. And then the man stood there and said, Does that paper tell about the lynching? And She said, yes. And he said, can I read it? And she gave the man the paper and he stood there reading while she was digging. And then he put the paper down and he stunned her by asking, would it be okay if I helped you? And then she told me that this white man got on his knees and he started throwing his hands into the soil with such force that his hands were getting coated with black soil and they were turning black and he was putting them in the jar and he kept throwing his hands and it moved her. And she said the next thing she knew, she had tears running down her face and she stopped and he stopped and he said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm upsetting you. And she said, no, 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 you're blessing me. And they kept putting soil in the jar and they got the jar almost full and then she noticed toward the end that the man was slowing down and his shoulders were shaking and she turned and looked and she saw that the man had tears running down his face and she stopped and she put her hand on the man's shoulder and she said, are you all right? And that's when the man said to her, no, I'm just so worried that might have been my grandparents that were involved in lynching this man. She said they both sat there with tears running down their face. At the end of it, he stood up and said, I would like to take a picture of you holding the jar. And she said, I would like to take a picture of you holding the jar. And they both took pictures. And she brought this man back and they put that jar on their on our exhibit together. Now beautiful things like that don't always happen when you tell the truth about history. When you try to actually look for redemption and restoration, when you have every reason to be afraid and angry, but until we commit to some acts like that, until we tell the truth, we deny ourselves the beauty of redemption and the beauty of restoration. 
God sought out Hagar and her infant son in the wilderness. He saw her, and he said her name. She mattered. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, a constant friend is he. My eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know, I know. He watches me. Amen. As we come to a time of prayer together this morning, let us remember all those in our church family with ongoing needs and concerns. Let us pray. Merciful God, it is so easy to forget that you hold this world in your hands. We think it is ours to do with as we choose. We think that we can decide who has your favor and who does not. Yet, if we listen to your word, we know this is not true. We know that you call us to much greater things. You would have us care for the earth and welcome all people. You protected Hagar and Ishmael and claimed them as your own. We pray you will do the same for those who now wander in the wilderness. Lord, hear our prayer. We give you thanks this day for fathers. We remember all the people who have nurtured us, especially the important men in our lives, those who have seen not just with their eyes, but with their hearts. We lift up to you fathers around the world, and we remember those who are no longer in this world, but at home with you. Lord, hear our prayer. Holy God, you know completely the joys and the pain of fatherhood. You rejoice when you see your children acting in love, and you weep when you see your children in pain. We lift up now all your children around the world who are oppressed, forgotten, or dismissed. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for your children who are sick, who are caring for those who are ill, or who are grieving the loss of a loved one. We remember those who are without jobs, those struggling to make ends meet, and those who are in strained relationships. Lord, hear our prayer. Eternal God, help us learn to love all your children with our actions. Help us to work passionately for justice so that all people may know your love through us. All this we pray in the name of our Savior Christ Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All good gifts come from God. With grateful hearts, let us now return to God our tithes and offerings. And stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard a tender whisper of love in the dead of night. You tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
Amen.